greetings, friends, and Merry Christmas. Nope, we're going to do better than that. Merry Christmas. There you go. There you go. It's great to be with you. I want to say welcome to Center Street Church. I want to join, I want to welcome all those that are joining online. I said last night that, you know, I only preach once a year. And so friends from around the country and the U.S. and stuff drop me texts and say they're, uh, they're watching. And so we have people around the world that watch our services. One of the four services is incredible to know that our friends around the world connect with us that way. So again, I just want to say welcome. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. We're looking forward to everybody getting together on Christmas Eve. And then next Sunday, Pastor Ashwin will be back with us as he continues the Matthew series and takes a look at Jesus the Nazarene. That's next Sunday at uh, 9, 11, and 6 here. I love this time of year, both personally and in the ministry. This is the third year that I have been blessed enough to speak. And three years ago, I spoke on a similar text. I spoke on the Magi and the gifts that the Magi brought Jesus and then talked about how we can bring, bring gifts to Jesus. Uh, last year, I spoke on Christian, uh, Christmas through the eyes of Simeon. And I kind of looked at that story. And this year, uh, when Pastor Ashwin and Kent put the preaching schedule together, they said, you know what, we want to take a look at this Matthew series. And we want you to look at, you know, the King of Kings. And friends, this, the King of Kings theme is the heart is that the Christmas story really is all about worship. And we're going to take a look at the account of the Magi who traveled a long distance to meet Jesus, the true King of Kings. Last week, Ashwin did a masterful job at unpacking the more difficult side of Christmas. And again, we look forward to what he is going to be bringing us next week on Jesus the Nazarene. And I realize that Christmas is not always easy for every, uh, 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 during this time. Some folks are really struggling. And, uh, and so my heart goes out to those that are, that are grieving a loved one today or those that are walking through this first Christmas without their family. And, uh, and I hope that this message will bring some hope uh, to us uh, collectively. When I was the campus pastor of our South Congregation, Joy Robinson served as the worship pastor with me. And you may know Joy. She leads mostly on the, on the evening services. But her love for Jesus is infectious. Her energy is inspiring. And her passion for leading people into worship is second to none. I remember a conversation I had with her as we planned a weekend service for the South Campus. I remember, I remember kind of lamenting to her going, well, I don't know how to put a worship set together. I don't really sing. I don't understand music. I don't play an instrument. I don't get this. I don't get the flow and all those kind of things. And I was kind of getting a little frustrated, right? And she said something that has stuck with me for these last few years. She said, Wayne, you may not know music, but you do know worship. I thought it was very profound in my life, friends, because worship is the most fitting response we have to the King of Kings. We're going to take a look at this text. So I'm going to ask you to stand uh, with me this morning as we read Matthew 2, 1 through 12. And Pastor Kent reminded us a couple of weeks ago is that we stand as a statement to the reverency of God's word. So would you join me as we read Matthew 2, 1 through 12? After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are no means by least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this incredible story, this 
this, uh, this movement, God, that happened so long ago by the Magi. I pray, Lord, today that it's going to speak to us in a new and fresh way. I pray for my friends here and online, God, that you're going to have fresh revelation from your word today, Lord, and I'm going to step out and get out of the way. Speak to your people, Father, through your word today. Encourage them. Bless them, Father. We thank you for what you're going to do in advance, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, have a seat. So there's a story about a church that had a man in the choir who couldn't sing. Others tried to help him find other places of ministry in the church, but he insisted on being in the choir. The choir director became so desperate that he went to the pastor and said, Pastor, you have to do something with John. If you can't persuade him to leave the choir, then I quit. And most of the choir will quit too. You've got to help us. Well, the pastor went to John, had a conversation, and suggested he leave the choir. And John said, well, why should I leave? Well, the pastor said, several people have told me that you can't sing. And John said, well, that's nothing. Fifty people have told me you can't preach and you're still here. <laughs> Just to be clear, that is not Center Street Church. It's not Pastor Kent and me. That's not it. This is an anonymous story. So, friends, I say that jokingly, but as we journey with the Magi for the next few moments and focus on the King of Kings and our response in worship, let me state that we're not talking about just worship music. We're not talking about services or choirs or song lyrics. Rather, we're talking about a different look at worship, worship from the heart. The kind of worship the Magi exemplified for us in this passage as they met the King of Kings. The first point I'd like to bring to your attention. The Magi sought the King of Kings. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, the word says, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, contrary to popular tradition, the Magi were not necessarily three kings. The scripture is clear that wise men visited Jesus, but it never specifically says three. There could have been more. This belief may have originated from the fact that they brought the three gifts. Neither is there any biblical support for the naming of the Magi. Right? Tradition beginning around the 6th century named the wise men Melchon, Belshazzar, and Gaspar. And as the numbering of the Magi, these names could be attributed to tradition and folklore rather than historical biblical fact. However, the Magi were a particular class of people. In the ancient world, they were learned men and scientists of the day. And they may, be, may have been Chaldean or Arabian astronomers. That's why they were studying the stars. We saw the star when it rose. So how was it that they had been, how were they known about this star? A star that would indicate the birth of the king of the Jews, who would be the world's savior. Although scripture is silent, it does give several clues. There's a prophecy spoken about Jesus' coming in which he is depicted as a star. Balaam, the unwilling prophet, had to speak the Holy Spirit's word to the future coming of the savior to the Israelites. In Numbers 24, 17, it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. So when the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, they asked, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So how did these Magi these non-Jewish people come to know about this prophecy of the Savior of the world, described as a star, and the actual star that would announce his arrival. And there's lots of research, lots of commentaries, lots of sermons that have been preached on this topic. One author contributes this to the Old Testament prophet Daniel, who was in Babylon. In Daniel 2.48 we read, Then King Nebuchadnezzar promoted Daniel, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. See, for me, Daniel was the head wise guy. He was the person that oversaw all of the wise men. So perhaps it was through the prophet Daniel that precise knowledge came about the star announcing the Savior's birth. In other words, centuries later, Daniel's mission work 
the telling of the good news of the Savior is bearing and has bore fruit. Over and over, the Bible baffles our curiosity about how certain things happened. How did this star get, from the, ma- get the Magi from the east to Jerusalem? It only says they saw the star in the east, in verse 2, and came to Jerusalem. How did that star go before them in that little 9.2 kilometer walk between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, as it says in verse 9? And how did the star stand over the place Stay in place over where the child was. And there's many opinions on this, and many, and many points could be brought forth. But for me, the lesson was really plain as I cross-referenced and looked at everything that's out, not everything, but looked at many pieces of research and scholarly wisdom on this. For me, it was simple. God is guiding people to the Christ, the King of Kings, to worship him. He's doing it by exerting global and probably even universal influence and power to get it done. He's using supernatural methods to draw people unto himself, to show that he's God, including placing that star. Matthew shows God's influencing the stars in the sky to help get foreign, non-Jewish magi to Bethlehem so they could worship him. The magi came to worship because they had discovered who Jesus was. They sought after him. A question for us, friends, is can we relate or do we follow the example of the Magi? Are we seeking Jesus? Are we using our natural God-given strengths and interests to seek him? See, the Magi were fascinated by the night sky. But here's my question to you. What, What fascinates you? Maybe it's biology. I know that there's doctors and nurses here. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's about how God made creation or how these bodies work of ours. Maybe it's sociology or anthropology and how God has made people and different ethnicities and different movements around the world. Or maybe it's math or logic or science and how things work in order and make sense. Or maybe it's writing Maybe it's that creative art. Maybe it's that expression that you so connect with. See, friends, all these things are created by God for us. And if we seek him in any one of these areas and numerous others, we're going to find him for he reveals himself in so many different ways. When we take that passion and, and we look at that revealing and then we couple it with a study of God and how he's revealed himself in the Bible, we can discover, just like the Magi did, who Jesus is. That's the opportunity that is given to us. And this Christmas, are we seeking Jesus, the King of Kings? Or as my one friend said, have we moved into routine? Now, I've, I've met and actually have kind of had a conversation the last few weeks here at Central Campus with individuals who have come up to, to meet me at the New Here booth and said, I need more. I got to know more about this. How do I connect? What do I do with this? And it gives me great hope and confidence, friends, that people are still seeking Jesus despite what the culture says, despite what statistics say, despite what articles say. People are still seeking Jesus. People are still finding Jesus today. And that gives me great hope for the future. So, thank you. Amen to that. Exactly. That's why we exist as a church, to introduce people to Jesus, right? So, I, I, I kind of look at this and I, and I, um, I kind of cross-referenced in my own mind and I thought, man, this seeking of God is so cool. I, I did a little quick uh, search on what my name means. Wayne, it means wagon maker. Um, now, I can't really even put together Ikea furniture, to be honest with you. I don't have those gifts. If you talk to any of my friends, and I've said it in many sermons, I, I'm just not talented that way. I have other talents, and I'm thankful to God for it. So I, I thought that if I was going to choose a, my name to be something else, it would be seeker of God. I'd want Wayne to mean seeker of God because I think that is something that I want to be known for, that I'm seeking and pursuing the relationship I have with Jesus Christ. How about you? What are you seeking this Christmas? Secondly, we see that the Magi rejoiced in finding the King of Kings. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. I found it great because this weekend's Advent theme is joy. And there's a lot of symbols 
at the Christmas season. And they represent so many different things. Santa Claus, right. mistletoe, wreaths, candles, and my personal favorite symbol at Christmas time, the stylish, very, very stylish Christmas suit. That's a bunch of good looking people, I'll tell you right now. And I still have the best hair. A symbol, one symbol that I actually have always kind of observed but never really looked into, and maybe you haven't either, is the whole understanding of the poinsettia. Now, did you know that the poinsettia was named after Joel Poinsett, who was a minister to Mexico in, and a native of South Carolina? He actually introduced them to America in 1825. And in Mexico, the poinsettia is called the Flor de Noche Bueno, which means Christmas Eve flower. Now, it is truly the quintessential Christmas plant. When you see them appear in the stores, you know that Christmas is not far away. Traditionally, the star-shaped leaf is said to symbolize the star of Bethlehem, and the red color represents the blood sacrifice for, of Jesus to, to forgive us of our sins as he died on the cross of Calvary. Just as this beautiful plant draws our attention to Christmas, the star over Bethlehem drew the attention of the learned magi, and when they found the child there, what did they do? They rejoiced. The Christian life is full of trials and difficulties, and as you heard Matt share in Kent, it's been a tough week at the church. I had the, the, the honor of facilitating Randy's celebration of life, and it wasn't easy. I remember one thing that Kara posted on Facebook was that after Randy passed, she said that Randy is dancing with Jesus in heaven. And then in, I cross-reference that in Psalm 30, 11, where it says, Jesus turns our mourning into dancing. The prophet Isaiah tells us in chapter 35, 10, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I love that song, that hymn. That's when I first started going to church. I remember singing that. Because fellowship with Jesus, friends, is both our present reality and our ultimate goal. We find joy in the journey to Jesus as well as our final arrival in glory. I like how the King Version says this in verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. John Piper says this is a quadruple way of saying they rejoiced. It would have been much to say they rejoiced. More to say they rejoiced with joy Thirdly, more to say they rejoiced with great joy, and even more to say they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. The quadruple joy. And what was this joy all about? They were on their way to the Messiah. They were almost there. It was that anticipation. They're looking forward to this. They're so excited. I can't avoid the impression that when true worship is not just about ascribing authority and dignity to Jesus Christ, but it's doing it with joy and being joyful. It is doing it because we've come to see something about Jesus Christ that is so desirable that being near him to ascribe authority and dignity to him personally is overwhelming and compelling, and it's something that just becomes part of our DNA. It's not something we talk about, it's something we do. They rejoiced in finding God incarnate. These men were learned scientists, and their worldview allowed them to accept God that could, he could indeed be found in human form. The miracle of Almighty God coming to earth in the form of a child in itself is a, it was a source of immense joy and wonder. That God himself would con condescend to us, live with us in our form, and fill us with joy. Of all the options that God had to reveal himself to us, he could have summoned the light of the heavens to write the message out for us. He could have thundered his voice throughout the earth and he could have called and stood at the edge of heaven and called us to come. Yet he chose to come as an innocent babe. To know our sorrows, to walk in our shoes and to intercede with his father on our behalf. And see friends, I believe that this was the source of joy. The one born was a prophet like no prophet before. He was like a king like no king before. He was the king of kings. 
And this truth should fill every one of our hearts with overwhelming, exceeding great joy. So friends, what are you rejoicing in today? Do you still get excited and filled with joy when you think of spending time with Jesus? The same way we do at Christmas when we look forward and anticipate and hear the scriptures from Matthew and Luke and we engage in all the different pieces of Christmas, do we really engage that worship peace with Jesus? Do you really rejoice? One of the staff here said to me, you know, you probably know the saying, Wayne, familiarity breeds contempt or perhaps just a lack of interest. And friends, sometimes that can happen with our relationship with Jesus. I know it has. I've, I've gone through dry spells myself where I haven't felt so joyful. But it, perhaps it's a sign that we've stopped seeking and that we're not, no longer discovering new parts of the joy of knowing Jesus. For he's, Jesus is the almighty, the eternal God in human form. And there's always more to discover about him. There's more in his word. There's more as we hear and interact we can experience more and more joy in him every day. I remember hearing a Christian comedian, he said, well, you know what? He says, a lot of Christians look like they've been baptized in bad vinegar. Right? Not he's really expressing joy. And friends, we gotta talk about this because we have that joy in us. And how are we showing it? Is, is our lives that express joy and reality in front of people what people want? Because friends, the world is not dying from a lack of religion. It's dying from a lack of relationship. So how is God inviting you to seek after him in newer, deeper ways? So you, like the Magi, experience that quadruple joy for real on your own. Where's the joy in your life? Because the world needs to see that. After the last service, I received a text from Joy Robinson. She said, Wayne, if you're going to change your name to mean seeking God, she says, I'm going to change my name meeting from joy to quadruple joy. I said, we can do that. So when you see Joy Robinson next, you call her quadruple joy, would you? Thirdly, the Magi worship the King of Kings. Right, this is the, the whole crux of what we're talking about this, this day, friends. They asked some kindergartners in Great, Great Britain about the Christmas story and the, vig, the visit of the Magi, and they had some interesting insights on it. One young boy said that the, the three wise men brought Jesus some gold and stuff. But Legos would have been way better. I love Lego. I just can't wait to play with Lego. You know, at Christmas time, it's that joy. In my introduction, I made reference to the quote that joy had kind of spoken to my life. And I wanted to define worship for you so that you understand where I've been coming from and where this last point will bring us. So the definition of worship is to honor or show reverence for as a divine being or supernatural power. The second is to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. And I see the Magi ascribing worship in these two definitions very clearly. Let's read it. On coming to the house, they saw the child with, their mother, with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then... They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Verse 11. Falling to the ground is what you do to say to someone else that you are worthy, you are higher, and I am lower. They fell down on their knees or faces to the ground, agreeably to the custom of their country. And they were saying by this action that you have great worth and dignity, and I am lowly by comparison. They worshipped him as king, giving him the same civil honor and respect that they would do to their own kings and princesses during that time. In addition to the honor and status of their, of their actual behavior, right, the value of the gifts the scholars have lots of different points with. And I unpacked it a few years ago. But one of the things that they say is that there was special, significant, spiritual symbolism with the three gifts. And here they are. The gold that was presented was for his kingship, being the king of kings. The frankincense was a symbol of his priestly role, and myrrh, a prefiguring of his death and embalming. An interpretation made very popular in the well-known Christmas carol, We Three Kings. And for me, this example of worship was for someone who did nothing to deserve it. 
Jesus had done no, nothing, no miracles, no fanfare, no nothing. But in faith, these people, these magi come from the east and come all the way there to worship, to bow down, to present their treasures and worship. See, Tony Evans, another author, says if you limit worship to where you are, the minute you leave that place of worship, you will leave your attitude of worship behind like a crumpled up church bulletin. That hit me. That worship is not just here, friends. That worship is all the time, everywhere. We have an opportunity to live a life of worship. So how can you worship Jesus this way in your heart? Not just when we come to a service, and we're going to continue to have services and studies and missional communities and those things. We're going to continue to do that here. But how do we, every day, I think that we can take the example from the Magi because they responded to Jesus by worshiping. They didn't get into lots of questions. They didn't get into, the, the text doesn't, doesn't say that they did all these inquisitive kind of things to make him prove to them that, they, that he was worthy of their worship. No, no, no. How did they respond? They responded sacrificially. They responded with generosity. And they responded in humility. That to me, friends, are signs of true heart worship. The truth is, when we look at this, the real giving, the real sacrifice, the real generosity and humility was not done and given by the Magi. It was given by the Father, by Father God. And we are reminded in the most, well, the well, most well-known portion of Scripture, John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The greatest gift ever given. See, friends, worship is a chosen lifestyle in our response to the King of Kings. May we give worship to the King of Kings with a grateful heart as we too have been given to. Finally, we look at the end of this event. And I gotta be honest in my preparation the last few years, and even before I preached at Christmas, I kind of would end at verse 11, and verse 12 really jumped off the page, because normally you don't have a four-point sermon, but today we're having a four-point sermon. So after the Magi sought Jesus, right, first thing, number two, they rejoiced in Jesus, then they worshiped Jesus, then they were directed by God in a dream. Another way to put it, put it they heard from God again and responded a second time. So, the Magi responded by listening. And it says, and, and, have be, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. See, friends, God is still reaching out to people around the world in dreams. We are hearing about hundreds of people from different religions and cultures and countries that Jesus is meeting in dreams and changing their lives. We had a presentation in our chapel but three weeks ago on what God is doing around the world in restricted access country, in persecuted countries that we can't get Bibles and missionaries and churches in, Jesus is meeting people in dreams and changing their lives. Think of it this way. Magi were far from home in all the connections, in a different culture, with different customs, with different people. And as I interacted with a friend of mine, he said, you know, most Jews would have probably looked down on them as unclean foreigners who are unfit to worship God. There was some persecution here going on. Yet, they were there. They had searched for him. They had found him. They had worshipped him. And again, when we go right back to the beginning of the text, friends, they followed the star. They were searching for him. They followed the star. They listened to him and followed the star to this point. They were led there by God because they'd been diligently seeking him, and perhaps for years. And their hearts had been shaped by that leaning, that learning. They journeyed this. They worshiped. They did this in faith. It cost them. They were sensitive to his voice. In fact, again, when I was talking to Greg Gruno about this, Pastor Greg said, Wayne, to me, that sounds like John 10, that my sheep know my voice and listen to me. And I've said it before that I believe that this true sign of a disciple, a disciple is someone who listens to Jesus and does what he asks them to do. Because Jesus himself said that. He says, I'm only going to do what the Father asks me to do. And so I think that that's a tie-in. Throughout the Old Testament, it was never just about the Jewish people. 
It was about people who were seeking after God and willing to trust and obey him. And again, when we look at the New Testament, Jesus shocks the Jews of this day with this kind of talk. The Gentiles, Gentiles praising a Roman centurion for his faith and others as well would rock that world because it wasn't the chosen people. But friends, the same is true for us today. It's not about our external stuff. It's not about what we look like. It's not about what family we're from, how much money we make, how much money we give. It's not about our place in the political scheme of things. It's not about who we are in our our public places. It's about internal. It's about our heart. It's about are we listening? We need to be people of the word being led by the word and the spirit of God. It's about receiving his grace and forgiveness, giving him control of our lives, using our lives to love and bless others. As we imitate the Magi's way of life and seek after Jesus and enjoy Jesus and worship Jesus, we're going to find that we're going to be able to hear what Jesus is saying to us and follow his lead through every circumstance that life might throw it our way. So we ask, what's, what's God calling us to, you to? What has he been saying to you in your dreams, your conversations, your relationships, and your time with the word. Let me put it this way. What star is there over your life right now that God wants you to follow so that you will find the Messiah, so that you will find Jesus again? Perhaps you're listening, and this is the first time you've heard about this, the acceptance of that star, that listening to what God says. You know, when we were planning the service, I was talking to Becky, and and Becky thought it would be a great way of responding in worship to this just before I close uh, by engaging us in a worship song that really encompasses what we've been talking about here this morning. Friends, praise to the King of Kings. Again, friends, we want to encourage you today to be seeking Jesus this Christmas season, that you're rejoicing in him that you're worshiping him and that you're listening to him. Following my closing prayer, our prayer partners will be up here to pray with you. I just want to encourage you to really embrace a new perspective on this Christmas season and look at these things. As Pastor Henry's been leading us for the last couple of years, right, he has us do this. He puts, he asks us to put our hands out And basically, this is verse 12 in that scripture. What is God saying to me, and what am I going to do about it? In a dream, they they did not go back the way they were told, and they went on. And friends, in the same, I just want to give you a moment. What is God saying to you about this text today? What is he asking? What is he sharing with you? And is there something that he's challenging you to do in response? Take a few moments, and I'll close in prayer. Lord Jesus, our King of Kings, we thank you for this incredible text today of the example of the Magi that we could actually apply in our own lives, the simple pieces of seeking you, rejoicing in you, worshiping you, and listening to you. God, as my friends and family here wrestle and ask you, Lord, what is it that you're speaking to them about? I'm so grateful that you know each one of us that you love us and delight in us, Father. It says you know every hair on our head. It says you, that you knew us before we, were, before we were born, you knew us. And Father, I just thank you, God, that your love is never so far away from us. So Lord, today as we worship the King of Kings, we ask God that you're gonna do immeasurably more than we could ever hope or imagine in our lives as we put more and more trust in you. Father, transform our hearts to be seekers of Jesus. So Father, I ask now, as my friends depart from this place, that you would bless them and keep them. That you make your face to shine upon and be gracious to them. Lift up your grace upon them, Father. Go with them this season. May they see glimpses of Jesus throughout this Christmas season as they spend time with families and friends. Continue to give them protection and blessing as they leave this place. We thank you for meeting with us, King of Kings, and ask God that you would do so much in our lives because we trust you with it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas.